Hey guys, it's Margot Atlan Turner back with another Applications and Interpretations IB Maths videos. We're going to follow up on our last vectors video with part two, where we're looking at some of the higher level content. So picking out some really key ideas in the higher level syllabus, which are really important, which I find students find a little bit more tricky conceptually sometimes. So we're going to be looking, first of all, at the scalar or dot product, followed by the equation of a line and then the cross product. So this covers points 3.11 and 3.13 on the high level syllabus. So without further ado, let's get started. So the scalar or dot product. There's a number of ways in which we can multiply two vectors together, unlike multiplying scalar. So for example, three times two is always gonna give us six, right? There's no arguing with that. But when we've got two vectors, multiplication isn't as simple as that we need to consider what type of multiplication we're using. Well, one of these types of multiplication is the dot product, or it's also called the scalar product. And the reason it's called that is because what it does is it takes two vectors, say A and B, and it multiplies them together such that our product is actually a scalar quantity. So that's why it's also called um, the scalar product. Now there's two ways in which we can compute the scalar or dot product and I've shown those in the two red formulas here. So first of all what we can do is we multiply or we use a dot product of a dotted with b and it's equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b, both scalars, times cos of theta, also a scalar, where theta as I've indicated in this diagram right here is the angle between our two vectors. Now, another way to compute the dot product, I've shown here a dot b, what we do is we multiply the corresponding x components of our two vectors and we sum it with the multiplication of our two y components and our z components. So here we have the x component of a times the x component of b plus the y component of a times the y component of b plus the z component, there should be a three, of a times the z component of b. There's a couple of really important results that follow from this. The first of those we obtain by looking at this first formula. a dot b is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b cos theta. And that tells us that when theta is 90 degrees, i.e. when a and b are perpendicular, the dot product is zero. Now that's a really, really important result. Um, that you should remember. The next result is that we have two parallel vectors when the angle between them is zero. The dot product is equal to the product of the magnitudes of the two vectors. Now another useful thing that comes from this first formula is that if we rearrange it we can actually find the angle between two vectors. So if we rearrange this formula to make cos of theta the subject we see that we have a relatively simple formula to find the angle between our two vectors. So next we're gonna have a look at the vector equation of a line. What I'm really gonna draw attention to is how can we visualize this? And to, in order to visualize vectors, we need to have a really good understanding of what different vectors represent and have a good understanding of those vector operations that we talked about earlier in this video. So the vector equation of a line, is given right here, where r vector is a vector which takes us from the origin to any point on the line that we're trying to describe. So r vector is a vector which takes us from the origin to any point on the line. Now, what is r equal to? This line that we're trying to describe, it's a series of points in space. a is the position vector from the origin to a point on the line. So say we knew the coordinates of this vector, uh, of this um, point a, which lies on the line. Well, then a is the position vector which takes us from the origin to that point on this diagram right here. To A, we add B, where B is the direction vector. And the direction vector is a vector that our line is parallel to. So, for example, we can draw this B in space right here. And we see that our line, which is the black line, 
what we're trying to describe, is parallel to that vector B. So B is our direction that our line is parallel to. We multiply B by lambda. And what lambda does, it parameterizes the length of the line. Now, what does that mean, parameterizing? Well, basically what it does is it tells us how far along and in which direction along the line we want to go. So let me just demonstrate that. Well, imagine that our lambda is equal to one. Then the point on the line we're trying to describe would be A plus one times B. So if we look on our line, what does that look like? Well, first of all, we're traveling along A, which as we said was the, direct, uh, the position vector from the origin to point A. And to that, we're adding B. And B is our vector here. So it has this length and this direction. So we're adding B, joining the tail of B to the head of A. So that's gonna take us to a point on the line about here. So that R overall is our vector going from the origin to that point. So it's a point on a line. Say for example, that lambda was equal to two. In that case, our R vector would be equal to A plus two B. So overall would be, so overall would be adding two B. Now two B will have twice the magnitude. So therefore, overall, we'll be going from our origin O to this final point right here. So what we've just demonstrated is lambda's role in this formula. It tells us how far along the line we want to go. And by varying the value of lambda, we can get to any point on our line. So this vector R takes us from the origin to any point on our line um, by varying that value of the parameter lambda. So let's have a look at a typical past exam paper then. This exam question is taken from a paper one, which means there is no calculator. And it reads, a line L1 has equation R and point P lies on L1 and has coordinates 15, 9, C, find C. So let's just recall what we said about the vector equation of the line on the previous slide. We said that R vector, which represents the vector equation of a line, takes us from the origin to any point on the line. And we get to the different points on the line by varying the value of the parameter, which in this case is S. So what we're looking to do here is we're trying to find the value of S such that we get to this point P, which has this coordinate. Now, to find the value of S that we're looking for, we know that our X coordinate that takes us to point P has to be equal to 15, right? The X coordinate of P is 15, and we know that the X coordinate um, of any point on the line is described by minus three plus six s, just taking that top component of the vector equation of the line. So from this, we should see that six s is equal to 18 and s therefore must be equal to three. So if our parameter is equal to three, this should take us to point P on our line, which means that if we substitute this value of s into our vector equation, we can find the z coordinate of this point P. So 10 plus two times S is our Z coordinate, is C. And we know that S is three, we've just worked that out. So therefore 10 plus two times three is 10 plus six is equal to C. And therefore C is equal to 16. So our Z coordinate is equal to 16. Okay, part B then, given a second line, L2, passes through the coordinates one, two, three, and is parallel to L1, write down a vector equation for L2. Okay, well, we already have an example of a vector equation in this question, right? We're told here, 
a vector equation and let's just remind ourselves of the different components which make up a vector equation of a line. So this first one here, we said A is the position vector which takes us from the origin to a point on the line. To that we add our direction vector uh, B which is a vector that our line is parallel to. And we have to multiply that by some arbitrary parameter, which essentially, if we fill in a certain value for it, tells us how far along the line we go. So L2 then will be described by the vector equation of a line. And first of all, we need to find a point that our line L2 passes through. And we're told in the question that it passes through the coordinates one, two, three. Therefore, the position vector which takes us from the origin to a point on the line, or to our point one, two, three, will simply be this um, vector right here. To that, we add our parameter multiplied by our direction vector. We're told that our line L2 is parallel to L1, therefore must be in the same direction as L1 and therefore have the same direction vector, 6, 0, 2. So there we have it. Unlike scalars, there's no one way in which we can multiply two vectors together. So in the last video, we looked at the scalar or dot product, which took two vectors and multiplied them in such a way that out came a scalar. Now we're looking at the cross product or the vector product and the name already gives it away. We're taking two vectors, multiplying them together in a way that we get another vector. Now we have an equation for this. It's not as nice as the equation for um, the scalar product, but it's given in our formula booklet and each component is given by taking um, a component of the first vector, multiplying it by a different component of the second vector and subtracting it by the reversal of that essentially. Now there's a lot of numbers in um, this formula so be careful when you're using it to pay really close attention to which component you're multiplying by which one and subtracting it from what. So let's learn a little bit more about this. As we said the product is a vector quantity. Now you might ask yourself if it's a vector okay well we get the magnitude of each component using this formula but can we visualize its direction? Well the vector um, product actually computes um, a vector which is perpendicular to the two vectors which we're multiplying and the direction of that vector is given by the right hand rule. So if we look at this diagram here, take for example two vectors A and B. If we multiply them using the cross product, well that vector C is going to be perpendicular to those two vectors. Now the question is then, does that perpendicular vector point up or does it point down? And that's what the right hand rule tells us. What we have to do is we take our right hand and we curl our fingers from vector A to vector B and in the direction that our thumb points is the direction of the cross product. So in this case it's up as we've shown in the diagram. Another property which we need to bear in mind, we're going to have a little look at it in more detail in the next slide, is this one here, is that the magnitude of the cross product is equal to the magnitude of vector V times the magnitude of vector W times sine theta, where again, theta is the angle between our two vectors. So some properties of the cross product. These properties that we're going to list in this slide are not given in the formula booklet, but it's really important that you know them. And the best way to do that is to really understand them. And with vectors, understanding often comes with being able to visualize it. So let's look at the first of these properties, V cross W. If we have V cross W, if we visualize what that cross product is, well, we have a vector V here and we multiply it by, we'll take the cross product with a vector W there. Then as in the last slide, we said that the cross product of those two vectors, V cross W, is gonna give us a vector, vector which is perpendicular to both of those. And it's in the direction shown here, V cross W. Using the right hand rule, curling our vectors from V around to W gives us a vector that points up. Now, if we take it the other way around, we do W cross V, we now need to curl our fingers in the opposite direction. So with V cross W, 
turn them in an anti-clockwise direction, but now we have to go in a clockwise direction to get from V, from W to V. And in that case, our thumb is now pointing down and therefore our vector W cross V is in the opposite direction of V cross W. And remember, the opposite direction with vectors is denoted by a negative sign. So hence V cross W is equal to the negative of W cross V because they are in opposite directions. The next property then, V cross V is zero. Well, if we think about what V cross V is, we're taking a vector V, and we want to find a vector which is perpendicular to V and V. Well, V and V are parallel, and therefore there's not really such a thing as a vector which is perpendicular to these two. There's no one direction we can think of which is going to give us explicitly a vector perpendicular to V. And how do we summarize that? Well, we say then V cross V is, double, uh, is zero. Next one then, u um, cross v plus or minus w. Well, we can just expand that as we would intuitively expect we can. Finally then, the dot product of u with the cross product of u cross w. Now, if we have a vector u and we have a vector w, then as we've said before, our vector u cross w is going to look something like this. It's going to be perpendicular to both our vectors, which means that the angle between our vector u cross w and u is 90 degrees. And if we remember from the dot product, the dot product, remember we said a dotted with b was equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b cos of theta, from which we deduce that for two perpendicular vectors, when theta is 90 degrees, the dot product is zero. So if we take u dotted with u cross w, we see if we represent these vectors um, in a 3D plane that that is going to give us zero. Good. So we had an equation on the previous slide, which I said we're going to pay a little bit more attention to here. And that is the equation of the magnitude of V cross W. If we take the magnitude of V cross W, we know it's equal to the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times sine of theta. Well, if we imagine these vectors V and W in space, and what therefore the magnitude of their cross product represents, if we look at this diagram here, we can convince ourselves that the magnitude of V cross W is actually equal to the area of a parallelogram because we can represent V sine of theta as this vertical length. And therefore, if we multiply it by W, which is the length of the horizontal side, we find the area of our parallelogram. Now, that's important to remember. And it's also important to remember what we can deduce from that, which is that the area of a triangle with sides V and W is therefore half of this magnitude. If we had a triangle with lengths V and W, then we can draw this triangle as follows. We've got lengths V and we've got length W and the angle between them is theta. So this red triangle is what um, we're intending to find the area of here. And we see that that is exactly half the area of this parallelogram. So therefore the area of a triangle is equal to half times the magnitude of V cross W. Now that's a really important application to remember. They don't give you that formula in the formula booklet, but they will often ask you to find the area of a triangle when you have information regarding vectors. Now in that case, you can go to use some of your um, triangle trigonometry rules, but that would take a lot more work than this really nice formula we've got here. So I really hope you enjoyed this video today, guys. I really hope you found it useful. I'm going to be back with more videos later, but in the meantime, check out some of our other videos from other great tutors in subjects such as chemistry or economics or ESS um, or geography. You can find those on our website or on our YouTube page. I hope to see you next time.